Welcome back here in the Tech Talk studio. This is the end of day number one. And we're here with three crypto cryptographers who just had their presentation. And here we have Tonja Lange. She's a full professor at the TU Eindhoven in coding theory and cryptography. Uh, Dan Bernstein uh, is a research professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And you're also a professor at the TU Eindhoven, right? And Nadja Henninger, and she's an assistant professor in the C Computer and Information Science Department of the University of Pennsylvania. Okay, guys, we all know crypto is very complex. It's difficult to explain to, to lay people, but we all work with crypto. We all depend on it. And uh, I haven't been to your uh, presentation because I've been downstairs here, but I heard some reviews of people saying, and if you read the titles, these are interesting times for crypto. TLS was broken and then broken again and again. Discrete logs were computed and then computed again. It's the crypto -apocalypse. How do you say that? <laughs> crypto apocalypse. Crypto apocalypse. No, and has the NSA backdoored everything inside? And you ended with the famous words, we are all screwed. Are we? Not. That was a little bit more pessimistic than I needed to be. Um, we are screwed in the sense that there are a lot of problems that need to be fixed. Um, but one of the reasons that we chose to talk about the news of the year in, in terms of cryptography is that it's sort of the first time that cryptography actually helps us, infor informs us about what is happening in politics, what's happening in commerce. And these are things that because it's so political in nature, the normal people actually have an interest in what's going on. And that's actually affecting sort of real political issues that are happening today. But, but where do normal people depend on crypto? Normal Could you people, give some examples? So if you buy something online and you enter your credit card into a website, you hope that the connection is encrypted so that your credit card number doesn't get given away to somebody else on the same Wi-Fi network. Yes, okay. So a like, typical example would be you have your browser and you see a little lock on the top corner, then the connection is encrypted, or you're making a phone with your cell phone, then you don't want that somebody else can make a phone call on your SIM card, so you want to have some connection between your calls and your SIM card, so that's also where crypto is being used. Now, we can debate how good the crypto is, but there is some crypto, so it's not absolutely easy to take over your SIM card, it's not so easy to steal your uh, internet money. In theory, everything can be broken, but you just need to make it as difficult as possible, right? I would say it's more that if you take a typical cryptographic solution from 10 or 20 years ago, then it can be broken. But we're getting to the point where we're developing solutions which actually can resist any feasible attack. So I wouldn't say that it's, it's hopeless in the sense of, oh, anything you do will be broken eventually. I think it's Crypto is moving forward, and we're coming up with solutions which really will last into the future. Uh, one of your famous questions was, has the NSA backdoored everything inside? Have they? Well, if you had asked this question a year and a half ago, most people would have said the NSA is actually a constructive agency that is making recommendations. So NSA and NIST were seen as, as positive, enhancing cryptography, enhancing security agencies. And then came last September in the Snowden revelations, there was a Project Bull Run, one of the programs being revealed, which says that NSA has been actively inv involved in backdooring cryptography, in weakening standards. And since then, in cryptography, we are running around a little bit more panicked than before, trying to figure out what of the things that we believe are secure are really secure, what of the recommendations that NIST made are actually still secure. Now, cryptography is not only NIST, it's not only NSA, so we had before, I mean, We've been giving talks on positive aspects of cryptography before, um, and we believe that they are still secure and unaffected. But NSA has been caught red-handed, so there is now uh, one incidence where it's very clear that a random number generator, so something which you need in order to have your connections be fresh, not always the same key, because otherwise they know, oh, it's you again, and you're sending again five euros. If I would see all the time five euros, then I would know next time it's five euros. So they need, they need some freshness. And in this freshness, in this part where randomness comes in, the NSA has been messing around with. So, so the random generator wasn't that random? Well, it is random. Predictable numbers so the NSA could... It is, it is a very interesting backdoor that it is random for everybody except for somebody who has a little bit of information. And okay. that party, let's call the NSA, can then go see some connection do a little bit of computation, and then predict all randomness that you're ever going to do. 
Yes. Okay. Um, I always have the naive, um, or perhaps uh, paranoid thought that as as soon as you crypt something, then the investigation services thinks, well, there must be something interesting in there. So if you follow the pipes, you just have to look at all the the, the, the crypto stuff, and then you have to peek in on that. Or is that just my paranoia? It should be that everybody's encrypting everything because. Realistically, there's so much information out there where people are relying on that being accurate information. They want to know where it came from. It should not be something which is just optional. It should be cryptographic protection, always making sure that you know here's where the information came from. And then it won't stand out if you're, if you're somebody encrypting information. You're just like everybody else because everybody needs cryptography to be sure where information is coming from. So yeah, we should have crypto by default. Uh, just this morning, we had John Callis with the black phone. Uh, we were talking about how do you bring cryptology to a broader audience uh, and with the black phone well he mainly mentioned uh, the ease of use you don't have to do a lot for it uh, you pay a little bit more but you get a fair price you know stuff like that my perception uh, can cryptology also be in a way cool you know hip to to sell it to bring to get people on the threshold what, what should you do to to draw these people in for all using cryptology or, or should it just be mandatory that's also a possibility that you what are your options data, get the girls yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> or should it be mandatory that's also an option that uh, i mean usability is certainly a big thing so if it's easy to use you're going to use it you're not actually thinking when you connect to your e-commerce site that you're using cryptography it just happens your browser has made the right settings and you're using crypto and at that moment, nobody thinks you're highly suspicious because you're using crypto, because that's normal. And we would like it to be more normal. I think crypto is hip in like our circles, and it's more, much more hip now with the Snowden stories. It has the spy story uh, yes. coming with it now, which is okay. pretty cool. So we're getting more students these days. Tanya yeah. mentioned cell phones as an example of where cryptography is used. Nobody questions the use of cryptography for cell phones because it's pervasive. Every single cell phone call that you make is encrypted to the tower. And that, to the end user, is completely transparent. They have no idea that that's happening. Mm. And an ideal, I think, that developers can work towards is having crypto be transparent to the end user. And an ideal that researchers can work towards is having the crypto be as easy as possible for the developers to implement so that it's a default for everyone. Yes, yes. And does it slow down computers, make it more expensive, or do we now have the power to make it just default? It can slow things down, and this is again something where a lot of the solutions that were out there, a lot of solutions that are deployed today are unfortunately too slow. So the users don't get to use them as often as they should. But I would say the new generation of cryptographic solutions are fast enough that we can put them everywhere. Oh, okay. I, I don't mean to be excessively optimistic, but I think somebody <laughs> has to set a positive tone here. Well, some people are working on making nicely deployable, fast cryptographic solutions for many different uses. For instance, you mentioned uh, John Callas, so their silent circle system is using something we have been doing. Okay. Um, there's another way where cryptology gets the attention of the broader audience, and th that's mainly when it's being broken. Uh, let's talk about responsible disclosure, which is also a topic on this uh, conference. Uh, did one of you uh, were involved in, in breaking a certain code and being involved in making it public for the public good? All of us. All of us. Okay, mention one. One. Um, a juicy case. A juicy case. Pink. So I had a paper two years ago where we scanned the entire internet um, for uh, TLS uh, public keys and also for SSH public keys. And we found really severe random number generation problems. We've heard about random numbers before. This was a, a slightly different issue. But essentially, there were keys that were so poorly generated that we could just outright compute the private keys in you know microseconds. Um, because they were incredibly vulnerable. Um, and this was a very complicated, I mean, we as academic researchers wanted to do responsible disclosure, um, but these keys were being generated by um, lots of little kinds of network devices, like little routers and, and firewalls, um, things that are doing cryptography because they just have standard libraries installed. But contacting dozens and dozens and dozens of companies was actually a gigantic burden. And we heard back from fewer than half of the companies that we tried to contact. Um, so yeah, the rule number one is inform the owner, but who's the owner? Yeah, so, so we, we did our best, but as researchers, it was a really difficult and problematic process. And um, ultimately, if I ever have such a complicated disclosure process again, I'm just going to go through a, an organization like CERT. Um, 
Okay. So that's, that's the lesson that I learned was don't try to con contact the companies. Most companies have no idea how to deal with yeah. security. Uh, so, but the people you could mention it to, how much time did you give them? The normal six months? Uh, that's also what you normally take for publishing a paper or did they need more or less time? Uh, so we gave them between like four months to two months before we uh, made the paper public. And many of, but we actually didn't mention the names of most companies um, okay. in our paper. Yeah. So we, we made the issue, the issue was publicized early on, but in a generic sense. And um, then we actually have not made the names of most of the affected companies public even now. And okay. some of them have chosen to, to release vulnerability reports since then. You were involved in the same case? Different another case. juicy case. We were Tanya. in another case together uh, when we broke uh, smart cards used in Taiwan. Okay. So actually a very nice system so every citizen can get a, a smart card which is then good for filing your taxes, uh, communicating, making purchases. You can go and register your car. So it's oh, like it was the <laughs> identity card so based on Java scripts? It's like, no, no, no. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a, so this was a smart card issue in the end. But I mean, it's like the digit ID for the Netherlands, except for in a more secure way because it's based on smart cards. Yes. And the smart cards had all the crypto that you would want. So I mean, they're now a little bit outdated. We would do better choices nowadays, but they were starting in 2003 and it was really good choices for them. And after Nadia's research came out that he just mentioned, we, with a bunch of friends from Taiwan, we were starting to look at these smart cards because, well, it's a public key system. So all the keys of the citizens are online, as they should be, because if citizen A wants to encrypt to citizen B, they can communicate. It's yes. cool. I mean, you can't do this here. There is nobody. I wouldn't know how to find your key. In Taiwan, I can find everybody's key, everybody who wants to communicate secure. So it's yes. really nice, except for, well, then we found certain vulnerabilities which showed up in the public keys. Oh, and okay. then, well, <clears throat> we now know what the secrets of some Taiwanese smart cards mm. are. So we could steal a house purchase for them or deregister them from the community or do something. We didn't do that, uh, but, but there we you, could have. But there you had an owner you could address, the, the Taiwan government or? Yes, so we addressed the Taiwanese government. We did not address the people themselves. No, of course. We um, were actually curious at some point because we didn't get the full response that we had hoped for. So at some point we were emailing those guys saying, um, hey, by the way, did you actually get contacted about this? Mm -hmm. Because we also have the email addresses. And even though we're like respectable professors, mm -hmm. They were a little bit irritated by receiving an email saying, I know your secret key. So, yes. so we, some of them were reacting positively and like, yes, we got contacted, but most of them were like a little bit distant and so mm. we were going through the government and we hope it's fixed. We're not sure it's completely fixed. Okay, but you kept on communicating on progress and yep. uh, how much time did you give them? We had several long conversations well, so and our Taiwanese co-authors I mean, were in notified. regular contact with them for months and months and months. I mean, they first notified them about a year before, more than a year then before we finally disclosed it. Okay. But there was on and off stuff. So. Yeah, you, do, you disclosed it through an academic paper? In the end, we published a paper about it, but at that moment, okay. um, they had contact with them uh, informally. It's public warning. Emails, phone calls. Okay, very yeah. good, very good. Yeah. Then. Your juicy case on responsible disclosure. I'll oh. give a case which I would say does not meet most people's definition of responsible disclosure. Good, because then we learn something. <laughs> well, uh, about 10 years ago, I taught a computer security course, and the homework for the students was for each student to come up with 10 new security holes in published software, and different holes for each student, not like all the students sharing. Um, uh, of course, they could work together, but if, if a student, uh, it, you know, if two students would work together for one whole, they each get half credit. Now, this was, in retrospect, maybe a little bit hard. A few of the students uh, came up with 10, but most of the students would come up with, say, only two or three. In the end, uh, in a class of 30 students, I think there were about 90 security holes that they found, but new security holes in, in software out there. And uh, looking back at that, if I think, oh, that 10 was asking a bit too much, um, that was quite a spectacular achievement from these students looking around at a lot of software and finding uh, that there were all these problems. Now, the result of that, I told the students, don't disclose these things yourself. You don't want to deal with that process. I'll deal with it. And what I did was I took the security holes that were the more interesting ones, I think I selected 44 in the end, and simply published those. And 
of course, this meant that for the people who were authors of the software where these 44 holes were found, those authors had to suddenly rush to do fixes where if I had done what's now called responsible disclosure, then those authors would have had more time, they would have been more relaxed, and they would have had months to fix something. But at the same time, there are other people at that time, and many more people now, who are putting more work into security and who were not distributing software with security holes. And as a result of that, by disclosing security holes in software where those people didn't put enough effort into security, I realized they had to do more work, but it also means it's better for the people who do put more effort into security. There's actually an incentive to pay attention to security when people disclose security holes. But, but what they did was actually full disclosure without warning or... This was full disclosure, time. yeah. Um, have you read the guidelines of the National Cybersecurity Center in the Netherlands? Guidelines for responsible disclosure? No, well, it's, about, it's like a, a bullet point list saying, well, you, you, you have to inform the owner of the system, That's give right. them time to repair and not leak to others, don't do damage, don't, don't copy uh, personal stuff like I that. I read an, a draft version and it was mostly requests, but it was very little promise in return. Right, because so, the other side, yeah. what are the obligations by the owner of the system? One thing they say, keep communicating on progress. You know, if you disclose to me and I have to report to you, okay, we're fixing it. What other things can you demand from an owner of an information system if you come forward with your disclosure? Some kind of response at all. An acknowledgement of the issues, um, a timeline for patching, um, mm. and, a, and a reasonable timeline for the researcher to be able to, to go public with their findings. Yes. And how about credits? As so academics, it's very important that you were the one who found the hole. But we need to be able to publish papers. That's our job. Okay, is publishing papers. Is publishing papers. Do. It depends on how interesting the issue is. Yeah. If you can publish a paper, then you publish the paper, get the credit. Okay. If they publish a vulnerability, they should say where it comes from. Mm -hmm. I mean, definitely acknowledge where the issue has been found yeah. and how it was brought to them. For full disclosure, it was easy. I simply, for every single one of the reports I had at the top, this was found by the following person. So each of the students got appropriate credit for what they had found. Okay. And yeah, of course, whoever does the work to find the vulnerability should get credited for it. But ultimately, what matters is that the software designer stops putting the vulnerabilities into the software to begin with. That's the best recognition you can get, right? Yeah. Well, in the Netherlands, we mainly give them a t-shirt. <laughs> Like, I hacked KPN and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. That will do. It works. It does. Some companies give yes. me. <laughs> um, well, but it can also w w work the other way. Uh, some, uh, even academics, get lawsuits. You know, you have this big firm with their fancy chips and you're about to publish and they say, well, if you do that, we'll take you to court. And they, they pull all sorts of tricks on you copyright, uh, even uh, freedom of speech. you got a certain responsibility on freedom. Uh, have one of you guys ever experienced something like that? A real aggressive company which was threatening for taking you to court for publishing stuff about their We Crypto. Not personally. No? Lucky you! Not personally. Well, <laughs> I have friends who have, but... You do? Yes. Okay, so it does happen. It does okay. happen. It does happen. It is something that is unfortunate, actually. As researchers, you shouldn't have to go find a lawyer in order to do your job. But that's actually something that is basically required now. If you're doing any kind of interesting security research, if you haven't had to call a lawyer in the process of doing your research, you're unusual at this I point. Mean, definitely when we did the dual EC research that was this uh, NSA employee's backdoor, we did contact lawyers at the beginning. Okay. However, the companies involved and the NSA are a little bit in the PR issue right now if they want to sue anybody. Hmm. You know, okay. it's, a, it's a giant burden on the, on the researchers to have to have a lawyer. And I mean, as, as a university professor, um, you have lawyers who work for the university who can help handle these things. And you have organizations like the EFF who um, will advocate on behalf of people who do security research. But as like a completely random person who just found something, you might not even be aware of that infrastructure. And that's where you can mm -hmm. often get into problems. Yeah. Okay. Um, your talk, and especially the title, was quite ominous. <laughs> you think that the whole world is going to collapse. Um, is it getting better or is it only getting worse? Both. Both? It's getting more publicly known that it's really bad. And that's a good thing. I mean... Awareness. Awareness is good. People 
recognizing that there is a problem that there is dragnet surveillance and that they need to take precaution if they want to stay safe online, that there is phishing attempts. I mean, there is a lot of necessity to educate people or to explain to them that, no, using crypto is not having something to hide. I mean, your comment at the beginning is, is fairly typical that people say, oh, no, but I, do, I don't need this. I have nothing to hide. Mm -hmm. And just explaining that it's not that you have nothing to hide. You still close the door to the toilet when you go there. Yes. It's just proper manners. And it should be like it's proper manners to encrypt your communication. Okay. That's, a, that's a positive thing coming out. And finding all the back doors, finding all the bugs in software is the first step that you need to do in order to make it work, in order to have good software. And maybe we already have good software, but we need to get rid of the bad software and okay. find a separation. OK, so we're lucky to have you guys to sort this out. Finally, um, this is your broadcast to the broader audience outside the National Cybersecurity Conference uh, to show what we're doing here. Any last thoughts you would like to share with our audience? You could again say we're all screwed, but it's not that oh, bad. We're, we're not, yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean... Uh, we're not all screwed. We're not Some of all them are. screwed. <laughs> but Most of the people are screwed most of the time. But not you, because you understand crypto and you're no, way we're, ahead. No, we're even worse off. For <laughs> even worse off? Okay, well, those are famous final words. <laughs> and, you know, we have to use the same, the same tools as everybody else. You know, it's not like we're... Even if we understand the cryptographic... That's the black tools phone. Tools inside. It's no, not. No, it's it is not. black it's and normal. it's a phone, but it it's just like a normal it. phone like everybody else has. Okay. And you know, what are we supposed to do? It's not like we're going to go build our own phones. Okay, it's some people we know are building their own phones, but it's a big process. Involves lots okay. of people that work together. Okay. It's that we know that these devices don't do what we want them to do, but that doesn't make us feel better at night. No. Yes. Okay. Crypto is fun. Crypto is fun. Crypto is yes. fun. I'm really jealous at you, smart guys. I am. Okay. Thank you very much for being here in the Tech Talk Studio. Thank Nadia, you. Dan, thanks for your time. And Tanya, yeah. okay. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.